It's 10 years ago this week that the Bengals finished off Buffalo for their 10th win of the season, and the fans gleefully chanted, who they think going to beat them Bengals? Ten years later, a lot has changed. The Bengals lost their 10th game of the season today, and the cry from the fans who were left is much different. It's reached a low point if you're a Bengals fan, wondering if it's all worth it. I don't feel real damn good about it either, Marla, to tell you the truth. How do you think I feel about it? How do you think the players feel about it? Maybe it's not worth it to us either. Actually, it was a gorgeous day to play some football. John Copeland was back in service, and some fans were feeling awfully good about what the Bearcats did in the middle of the night. Some sections were sparsely filled, some were spiritually filled. The Bengals tightened their helmets and the fans tightened their bags. And the Bengals came out with a rush. Paul Justin to Carl Pickens, who was open in the middle of the field. And then Corey Dillon got a handoff and picked up 14 yards as the Bengals showed a good mix to open the game. But as often happens, the well dried up at the 25. And when Doug Belfry was wide slightly to the right, the Bengals came away completely empty. Midway through the first period, the Jaguars got good field position from the punt team. Mark Brunel improved it with his pass to Pete Mitchell inside the 30. At the 21, the Jags contemplated a fourth and two. Yeah, I knew, I knew they were going to try to run fade. I mean, because that's what they do down there. They run fades and just put the ball up. Uh, I knew it was coming. But in the case of Artrell Hawkins, knowing it was coming and doing something about it were two different things. He followed Jimmy Smith into the end zone, 7 nothing Jags at the end of a quarter. Early in the second quarter, Justin to pass from his 30. Throws instead to linebacker Kevin Hardy, who then advances the ball to the Bengals' 11-yard line. My arm got hit when I threw it, and the uh, ball, the trajectory of the ball got altered, and, you know. The view from our ground-level camera shows Jose White pushing Rich Bram backwards. The tangle of arms changed the route of the pass. It took the Jags only three plays to get back in. Mark Brunel to Keenan McCardell, who dashed over the middle, 14-0 Jags. And a few of the fans knew this was the kind of afternoon they were in for. But they really had no idea, because within moments of that anguish, the Jaguars kicked off to Bengals' Tremaine Mack. As he tried to keep his feet, the Jags' Dave Thomas ripped the ball loose, and Mike Logan was the first guy able to fall on it. This resulted in only three points. Mike Hollis kicked a 23-yarder, giving Jacksonville a 17-0 lead. Enough of a cushion to prompt one fan to open a good book. Maybe this would produce some excitement. Yeah, maybe not. Down on the field, the Bengals turned the page, and Bruce Coslett sent in Neil O'Donnell. I just made a quarterback change. I mean, that's all there was to it. We weren't moving the ball, so let's change quarterbacks. O'Donnell began with his patented side toss to Brian Milne, a play that lost one yard and about 10,000 fans. But O'Donnell did manage to rally the offense. A pass to Tony McGee gets the ball past midfield. A pass to Carl Pickens, the Bengals are inside the 20. A pass to Darnay Scott, the Bengals are inside the five. And Brian Milne finished the series with a one-yard plunge, and the Bengals were on the board. An event so startling, the Jaguars came unglued. First, Damon Shelton dropped the surefire first down pass from Brunel. And then on the very next play, Jimmy Smith dropped a surefire touchdown pass from Brunel along the sidelines. Not that this made the believers out of those in attendance. But then the Bengals drove at the end of the half, highlighted by a superb Carl Pickens catch. Three points on a Doug Pelfrey field goal were added, and the Bengals trailed by only seven points into the locker room. A talented Frisbee-catching dog came out and showed what it's like to stick with a pass, even a tough pass. Though this little girl seemed to look around and wonder, Daddy, do you think we'll ever come to the stadium when the highlight of the day isn't the Frisbee-catching dog? Anyway, the Jaguars began the second half with a field goal. Mike Hollis from 47 yards away. This was a 10-point game. And then here come the Bengals from the 29. Corey Dillon went left, skipped over linebacker Tom McManus, and busted into the clear. Pass midfield. At the 35, Carl Pickens slammed Donovan Darius out of the way, and Dillon isn't tackled until he's reached the Jaguars' nine. Two plays later, we pick up the call from Bob. Behind the quarterback, O'Donnell, is Dillon, who goes in motion, comes this way now. And O'Donnell drops to pass, pumps once, throws it oh, back yeah. in the end zone. Touchdown, Tony McGee and Cincinnati. They're down by a field goal. Things were looking good for the Bengals. 
I don't know what happened. I mean, we was playing good football, and then all of a sudden, Al just went out. It seemed, you know, we were, we, we got back in the game, and then every time we got back into it, boom, they went down and scored. This was the perfect example. Down only by three, the Bengals' defense immediately gave up a big gainer to Mark Cardell on the first Jags play from scrimmage. On the second play from scrimmage, Brunel hit Pete Mitchell in the clear, and the Jags were already at the Bengals' 30. The Jaguars didn't give the Bengals a chance to feel good about themselves. Brunel, a nicely thrown ball to McCardell over Ashley Ambrose, and the lead was 10 points after three quarters. As the final period began, this day soured in a hurry. A Bengals drive is stopped when O'Donnell's pass to Pickens is tipped and intercepted by the Jaguars' safety, Chris Hudson. The Jags moved to near midfield and then let it loose again. Brunel went deep to Jimmy Smith, who had the position on Bengals' cornerback, Artrell Hawkins. All day long, I was getting picked on the day. Uh, I don't feel like it was a complete waste of a day. I made my plays on the ball, you know, broke up a pass or two. Uh, they came after me a lot. But truthfully, the entire secondary was victimized. Brunel to Damon Jones, and the route was on. Then with less than eight minutes to go, the snap was fumbled by the Bengals. When they finally uncovered it, the Bengals had lost the ball. Neil O'Donnell had lost his helmet. And the Bengals quickly lost most of the faithful who had stuck around. They should have played the theme from Exodus on the loudspeakers. Those who stuck around booed, or worse yet, held up banners critical of team owner Mike Brown. Security officials quickly descended on the protesters, ripped away the banners, and dropped them down to the stadium's official banner disposal squad. Much to the chagrin of some fans, who were then escorted out of the stadium. One banner was allowed to hang, that banner told the plain truth about why so many fans are disgusted, why some fans are bagging another season. The booing and disenchantment didn't escape the players. It's embarrassing, man, because it takes a toll on you to tell the truth. You know, we feed, whether they know it or not, we feed out the crowd. If it didn't bother us, you know, we need to go do something else. You know, it's, it's they're booing you. They're booing, you, you know, the way you're doing your job. It was just more of the same, more wear and tear on the state of pro football in Cincinnati. We try to win every time we go out there. I mean, I know I do. I know a lot of guys in here do. You know, it's frustrating. It's really frustrating. And the fans know exactly how he feels. One fan put up a thanks Mike banner where the Bengals exit the field. Thanks for a team that's going nowhere once again.